But you see down there that that was written by, or was a Swedish folk melody that Stuart Hine sort of adapted for a hymn. Not sure what that Swedish folk melody was, but you can probably look it up and figure it out. We're living in the last days. I really believe that. Hebrews 1, let's look there in our Bible. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Please. Chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And the Hebrew writer gives this declaration of praise. He's the radiance of glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. When Judah was born, we'll see on Sunday, Leah says, um, I'll give you praise. She recognizes that she's worthy of praise to her God. You know, she, the other three boys up to that point um, were really in her attempt to garner the love of her husband. But she gets to the fourth child of Judah's born, Judah, who is of the seed of the woman who will bring forth the Messiah. When he's born, she says, well, I'll give you praise now. And so we, the, the, the writer of Hebrews, just takes that praise that Leah started and magnifies it because the seed of uh, the tribe of Judah, the seed of the woman, is uh, the heir of all things, the radiance of the glory. So we're living in these last days. We're talking about today what will happen when Christ returns. Uh, the study of the last days or last things is called eschatology. Eschatology matters for how we live. Uh, sometimes it can be a scary endeavor, especially if you try to read and study the book of Revelation. You can read it and it can seem almost a little frightening. Maybe you or someone you know thinks that studying the end times is a fruitless endeavor. And say, well, I'm not going to mess with the book of Revelation. It's too hard. I, I, I just leave that to the end. I don't, I don't need to know about that. Um, but that would not be a, a helpful way to look at the book. Uh, the book often, or even, not often, even has a, a promise to those who take an opportunity to read it. And so, Revelation 1.3, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what's written in it, because the time is near. So we don't want to just put off Revelation. We spent some time back in the beginning of 2019, I guess, uh, walking through the first uh, couple chapters as we looked at the, the churches that, uh, that, that he was writing to. We will keep going in it. I know many were disappointed that we stopped. We'll keep going. Um, but blessed is he who reads the prophecy of that book and, and because the time is near. God has promised his blessing to those who endeavor to know more about him through his word. And so I'm grateful that you, or those who might be joining us online later, or watching later, um, I'm grateful that we get to be that kind of people. People who are blessed, who want to study and know more about him through his word. 
So I, I put the discussion, this discussion question on your paper because I thought it was a, a fun one. It, there's no right or wrong, okay? So don't feel like, oh, I don't know what to say. It might be wrong. Why do you think Jesus decided to leave the world for a time and then return rather than staying on earth after his resurrection and preaching the gospel throughout the world himself? a scripture that uh, in conversation with the disciples that might come to your mind that might help you answer that question or at least think through it. He said it would be better. Okay, yes. <laughs> he said it would be better that he go. And why was that? He would receive the Holy Spirit. Yes. The Holy Spirit would come as a gift then. And so we would say better in quality, not better in quantity necessarily, right? I mean, better, or I mean, no, better in quantity not better in quality, all right? So the quality of, of having Christ here is huge. That's, I mean, that would be great. But in the matter of quantity, uh, the presence of God in, in us and then who gets to just disperse throughout the world uh, would be better, absolutely. So the scriptures tell us the answer to this. Um, it might be easy to think, oh, I, I just it would be so nice to be able to invite Jesus to my house for dinner have him sit at the table and open the scriptures to me like on the road to Emmaus. I mean, sure, you might think that that would be great and it would be great to have Jesus, but we have the spirit, we have the, the presence of Christ in us who if we want to sit down at the table and have dinner with the word, we can. We can grow, we can, we can learn from him in doing that. So we talk about the second coming of Christ and so on your notes there, the top little piece says, so to begin the end, so if we're going to begin talking about the ending, we need to know that the Bible promises a literal return of Christ. So that word literal goes there. I want to make sure we understand that and not miss that. Jesus came once to make atonement for sin, and he'll come again to consummate his rule wants to make atonement for sin, he will come again to consummate his rule. Hebrews 9, 27 through 28 says, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, this truth uh, is taught Throughout the New Testament writers, the apostles, uh, I put the references there for you. I didn't write out the verses, but you can check those out. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. All right, so there's this literal coming back. The Lord's brother James there in 5, 7 says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. There's this anticipation, this expectation that the literal coming of Jesus will happen. Where did these men get this understanding that Jesus would return again? Well, Matthew 24, I put the reference there for you. Matthew 24, 30 through 31, when sitting with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, Jesus tells them, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to another. So this second coming of Christ is often referred to as the day of the Lord. You see that in your notes. Uh, some other similar phrases make that clear in the scriptures, this day of the Lord. It's a phrase, when we talk about the day of the Lord, and you see that, it's a phrase that speaks of both calamity and judgment, that's on your notes, a phrase that connotes both calamity and judgment, as well as salvation. So when you see that in biblical text, the day of the Lord, it, it, it means those things. Zephaniah, 1, 15 through 18, I gave you the reference there. And I actually, uh, that's 
we'll get down to Zephaniah 3, 9 in a second. But Zephaniah 1 says, when the Lord Jesus returns, or Zephaniah says, that day, the day that he returns, will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, because they've sinned against the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live in the earth. So there's that calamity and judgment. That doesn't really sound very good, does it? <laughs> it was like, I thought his coming was supposed to be a good thing. Well, it is. Then you get to Zephaniah 3, 9. At the same time, the whole world will be consumed by the fire of God's jealous anger. God says that he will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. So there will be, for those who are in Christ, it will be a day of rejoicing. That's what goes in your blank there. That day of judgment for the ungodly will be a day of rejoicing for the righteous. Rejoicing for the righteous. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the righteous will be rejoicing in the calamity of the unbeliever. That's not what we're saying here. So I don't want, I don't want us to misunderstand that. We're not rejoicing in their harm. But, but at the same moment that it's harm and calamity to the unbeliever, it will be rejoicing and great hope for the believer. So a couple of things I want us to look at about the nature of his second coming. And so um, you see there letter A uh, to help us understand what it will be like. There will be a personal, visible, bodily, that's what goes there, a personal, visible, bodily return of Christ. We do believe that Jesus will come back himself in his person. So on the blank on the top of page two, in his person. This does maybe seem to you like, duh, <laughs> for those of us in an evangelical church, but it was once popular in liberal Protestant circles to believe that Jesus himself would not come back. Instead, the teaching was that an heir or an aroma of Christ would come back and an acceptance of his teaching and some sort of imitation of his lifestyle of love for others would increasingly fill up the earth. So the teaching was Jesus himself wasn't coming back, but his personality was going to come back. And because of who he was, that would sort of fill the earth, permeate the earth, and things would just get better and better and better. And so as that's happening, the ethical norms from the Sermon on the Mount, the things that he taught uh, in that famous sermon, would be established, and then utopia would happen, and we would have peace on earth. There were some in liberal, Pro in liberal Protestant churches that believed that. But that's not the message that Scripture gives to us. The Bible teaches that the incarnation of the Son of God was not his, and this is on your notes, it was not his last manifestation in the flesh. So he came in the flesh once. When? When did he come the first time in the flesh? Yeah, when he was born. Yeah, at Bethlehem, the incarnation. We celebrate, we're getting ready to, to celebrate that. Come let us adore. It's going to be our celebration this year. His incarnation. So yes, that... But, but Scripture says that wasn't the last time that he was going to come in the flesh to the earth. John 14, 3, Jesus says that he will come back. When Jesus ascended, we see the description given in Acts chapter 1. Without delay, two angels came and said to the disciples, This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. So what they saw is his ascension saying that there will be a, a coming back. So, on your notes there, the Lord's eschatological return won't be a spiritual coming, like the liberal Protestants said. The aroma is just going to come back. 
No, it's not going to be a spiritual coming to dwell in people's hearts and make them happier and more ethical, but a visible, bodily, and personal return. Really is coming. The real flesh. And it's going to be glorious. Glorious return. Matthew 16, 27 tells us Jesus will return in his Father's glory. And it appears, best we can tell, that glory will be visible to all. To all. Revelation 1, 7, John writes, Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. Likewise, where we read from 1 Thessalonians earlier, Paul says the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. We're not going to miss that. Christ's return is not going to be done secretly or stealthily. It's going to be loud and clear. That's in, on your notes. Loud and clear and announced. And everyone will know that the Son of God has come. It will be a fitting return for the King of Kings. You've seen movies or even cartoons talk about it or so, I mean, all ages could, could relate to, you know, when somebody of, of importance comes and they play the trumpet or, you know, da, 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 you know, I mean, there's some sort of announcement that here's something important or here's someone famous. Well, when the king of king comes, you'll know. There'll be an announcement. There'll be a declaration of his coming. Well, the second thing I want us to know about is coming is it's unknown. The time of Christ's coming is unknown. Scripture does not disclose the time of Christ's second coming. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So why, as we think about this, why does God not reveal to us the exact time when Christ will return? Where? If people knew, they wouldn't wait for God now. They would wait for a week, a month, four. Okay, he's coming in a month. I better get right. You're right. Yeah. So absolutely, Miss Martha. So there's that sense that if you knew he was coming back on December 31st, 2020, everybody would just live like they wanted. Yeah. That until that day yeah. and I mean chaos would reign on the earth nobody would care about one another there'd be no purpose there'd be no proclamation of the gospel because nobody would come and sit to hear this word because this word would judge their actions and so then on December 30th you know at, at, at 11.59 I guess everybody would try to get saved and then yeah. you know this, yes exactly Ms. Martha I think that's definitely a part of it and if you told us about that then because of our sinful nature, because we know how we are, <laughs> because I know what it means to procrastinate, personally, I could see, I mean, if, if he told us, oh, wait till that day. Day before. Yeah, the day before. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, the day that day. That's right. The day before. But don't you think some people will start studying and reading the Bible and getting ready for this? You mean if they knew the day? Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe there would be some, but, but because Scripture says that all of our evil, I mean, our hearts are dark, there's just evil intent, it would be few, you know, because our hearts are so self-seeking that we would just want to do our own thing. If we knew that he was coming back on December 31st, then, oh good, I'm good till December 30th. We wouldn't be reflecting any of this, would we? No, right. That's right. I'll tell you what, yeah. a lot of dead, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. I'll be in you later. Absolutely. Paying it off, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about that death we were reading. I think it was in one of the kids' devotions this, this week about, you know, the Israelites as they wandered for that 40 years out of discipline. I think it's in the 80s, but there were, it said like there were roughly 87 funerals a day. 
because about a million four hundred thousand people died. You know, that generation had to die off yeah, right. before they could enter the promised land. So that rounded out was about eighty seven funerals a day. Uh, Zachary was like, I think it was Zachary. He said, Could you imagine Dad doing 87 funerals a day? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's right, Matthew. <laughs> I mean, that is what it would, I mean, that you want to look at what it would be like if you knew, because the Israelites didn't necessarily know they were going to get to enter the promised land. That generation just knew that they weren't going to get to, except for the, you know, the two spies. So they didn't know. And look how they were living. And so many of them were just like, oh, well, I don't get to experience the, the promise, so. <laughs> yeah. I think, and, and we've alluded to this, the second part of that discussion, how does not knowing Christ will return affect our Christian life? I, I hope, Miss Juanita, that it, it not knowing does help us to want to be in the Word more, to want to be ready, to be prepared. Um, I hope so. Matthew 24, if we keep going in verses 42 through 44, Jesus makes it clear why it's not for us to know when he will return. He says, keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will return. And that watchfulness, I know I've said it before, because I remember being up here and saying it about these windows. I mean, it would be like a child who isn't quite tall enough, but I go out of the camera, but I'm sorry. Anyway, you can you get the idea that if a child, you know, somebody says, "Well, Daddy's home," and the child comes to the window, but he could probably better reach that window back there, and 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 he's climbing, he's pulling up on it, and just can barely get his little eyes over the. I mean, that's the that's what this word uh, means when it talks about keeping watch. I mean, it's with that same kind of intensity. You know, Daddy's coming home, and the child runs. And, and, and lifts up and, and just can barely peer out before they're watchful. That's the, the idea that the author has that we should be, that that watchfulness, that we should hear the words, I'm coming soon, and we should be at the windowsill, like just peering out. That's what um, we mean when we say keep watch. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Makes sense. If somebody told you they were coming at midnight to break in, you'd be up at midnight ready. Really? Right. <laughs> so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus then illustrates this teaching again when he talks about the parable of the ten virgins right there in the next chapter of Matthew 25. He's driving home this message. Keep watch. Because you don't know the day or the hour. Now, despite that, despite that being so clear, right in the Word, there are people who have this insatiable desire to seem to want to know the when. And they even put out there when it's going to be. You see it not only on the tabloids at the Walmart checkout, but you also see it in the teaching of many religious sects. Some even claiming the name of Christ. But those sects, you know, still would say, oh yeah, he's coming back at a certain time. I forget the name of the man. Pastor John, do you remember the name of the man who, who just within the past few years, you know, made his next claim about it? Oh, yeah, 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 he was wrong. I, my, my most vivid memory is the man who wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why He's Coming Back in 1988. Oh, yeah. I remember that one. Uh, I, I didn't read it, but I remember it. But it must have been around 2013 when that man made that next prediction because one of my former students uh, from Charleston called me and he was like, Chris, do you really think that it's going to be you know, in the next few days? And I was like, no, it's not. No. That's right. And, and, and so when you think about that, it is not a sign of godliness. This is on your notes. It's not a sign of godliness to predict something with certainty that God says we're not going to. That does not make you look more godly to the world. And you can go around saying, oh, I've got the, the date. Jesus commands us to watch. That's what he calls us to do. He doesn't call us to look at the calendar and say it's going to be that day or make that prediction or whatever. He calls us to watch and be prepared. 
We are to be ready as for an event that could happen at any time. This seems to indicate, when you, you read this, it seems to indicate that it's possible that Jesus could come back at any time, even today. But then you say, well, wait a second, Chris. Scripture does present this idea that there will be some signs that will precede the return of Christ. And if you were to say that to me, I would say, you're right. That is true. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 all contain Christ's teaching on signs of the end of the age. For example, Luke 21, 11, Jesus said there will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilence in various places, fearful events, and great signs from heaven. Well, you don't have to go too far back in history to see those things and think, huh, those are some signs. I gave you a little rough summary of the signs, how you could consider them. There's signs that evidence the grace of God. In other words, his giving grace to us. Well, one of those is the proclamation of the gospel to all nations. That's God's grace to us. And then, of course, the sign of salvation of the fullness of Israel. I'm not saying that every Jew will be saved. That's not what I'm, I'm trying to teach here. I'm just saying the fullness of what God meant when he called Israel. Look at the signs evidencing opposition to God. Tribulation, apostasy, the Antichrist. Obviously, people said Hitler, when his regime was picking up, a lot of people thought this must be the Antichrist. And rightfully so. Some of the things that he declared and some of the comments that he made would certainly lead someone to believe that he might have been. And then there are signs evidencing the judgment of God. There's wars, earthquakes, and famine. But here's a good question. Many people have asked this question. How do we reconcile passages that warn us to be ready because Christ could suddenly return at any moment? How do we reconcile that with passages that indicate several important events must take place before Christ can return? What do we do with that tension? Well, three major solutions are given to that tension. Without too much detail, we can say that except for the spectacular signs in the heavens. It's unlikely but possible that the signs preceding his return have already been fulfilled, right? Now, the signs about the moon turn, you know, obviously that hasn't happened, okay? But it is unlikely but possible that the other signs could have been fulfilled. Moreover, the only sign that seems certainly not to have occurred would be the darkening of the sun and moon and the falling of the stars. But that could occur within the space of just a few minutes. I mean, the sun could go out right now and the stars could start falling. So it seems appropriate to say that Christ could now return at any hour of the day or night. So it is therefore unlikely but certainly possible that Christ could return at any time. We have to balance that because we want to say, oh yeah, he can come back at any time, but wait a minute, I thought you said there had to be signs. That are, that, how do we reconcile that? Well, maybe the signs have happened except for the darkening of the sun and the falling of the stars. And that could happen at any moment. And, and so maybe he really could come back at any time, any moment. But does this position do justice to the warnings that we should be ready and that Christ is coming at a time we don't expect? Is it possible to be ready for something that we think unlikely to happen in the near future? Yes, everyone who wears a seatbelt when driving or everybody who purchases auto insurance gets ready for an event that he or she thinks is unlikely to happen. In a similar way, it seems possible to take seriously the warnings that Jesus could come when we're not expecting him and nonetheless, to say that the signs preceding his coming will probably yet occur in the future. It doesn't negate that Jesus said, be ready, be watchful, I'm coming. To say, is he going to come in the next one second? Because we haven't necessarily seen these signs happen. But maybe we have seen these signs happen, except for the sun, the moon, and the stars. But that could happen at any moment. There's a balance there. There's a great balance there. So we eagerly, that's letter C, Christians should long eagerly for Christ's return. We want to long for it.
Can we be ready for something that we think unlikely to happen in the near future? Of course. And so we eagerly long for Christ's return. It is our blessed hope that's on your, on your God. It is our blessed hope. Regardless of the specific details of Christ's return, our response should be the same. We should eagerly desire and long for Christ's return in glory. It's the overriding hope of the Christian life that this will take place. Scripture is very clear about this. We don't know when he re will return, so we strive for holiness. That's on that blank. And stand firm in the Lord. Please don't leave here and think, well, Chris doesn't believe that Christ can come back at any moment. I don't, that's not what I want you to leave here thinking that I'm saying. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that those, those events, that the Bible, those signs may, may have already happened except for the lunar, you know, the sun and solar and lunar things and stars. It's unlikely that, the, that all of these things have happened yet. It's unlikely that the Antichrist has come yet. But I'm not saying that he couldn't come at any moment. I'm saying we're to be eagerly waiting. I'm saying, yes, there are signs that have to happen. And so I'm just holding the tension that he's coming back. He is coming. And so our call is to be waiting and longing and expecting him. We don't know when he'll return, so we strive for holiness. Titus 2, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And what are we to do? We're to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who is zealous for good works. John 3, 2 through 3. Beloved, we're God's children now. We wait. It's not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him. We shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes and him purifies himself as he is pure. So you say, what are we to do in our waiting? We're to strive for holiness. We're to strive to live like he is. What, what, like he lived. Philippians 3, 20 through 4. Um, one says, but our citizenship's in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Philippians 4, 1. And therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. John's response in Revelation to Jesus' claim that he will return is simple. And it's gloriously appropriate. He says, come, Lord Jesus. Or he says, amen, amen. Let it be so. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus' return, and this is on your notes there, is the event that gives us hope as Christians. It confirms, Jesus' return, that promise, it confirms that history is not a despairing cycle. That's what goes in that word. There are other worldviews. There are other world religions that believe that, that history is, is just a, is, is a cycle that, that just goes round and round and round. Karma, you've heard that word. That's what, that's the idea that, you know, that everything just comes back in a circle. That's, that worldview is secular. We believe in Christianity that, our, that, that history is linear. It had a beginning. In the beginning, God was already there. Creation had a beginning and it's headed toward a future. It's not cyclical. Jesus, his return confirms that history is not cyclical, but the story of a God who redeems a people to the glory of his name. The doctrine of the second coming proclaims that God is in control and Christ will come again for his chosen ones. Jesus said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, he's going to prepare a place for if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back. See, there he says, I'll come back. I'll come back and I'll take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. You get it all right there. I'm going to prepare a place for, for you and I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to be where I am. 
How many times a day do our thoughts turn to that hope? A lot? Often? Occasionally? Rarely? Never? I mean, how many times during the day do we, do we look and, and, and consider the hope that he is coming back? If we're not turning to this hope more often, then perhaps we love this world more than we should. And so I, I hope that we would grow to be a people who return to the hope of his coming more and more and more. This last little bit I want to share with you because it, it's obviously a place that people have some disagreement about, and, um, it, but I want to talk about it, present it to you. Uh, it's the millennium. If you've been here throughout the 20 and 20 series, you know we've talked about a lot of difficult topics. We've talked about the incarnation, we've talked about evil, we've talked about the Trinity. Those are some difficult things we've had to think through. But this next section on the millennium has its own set of difficulties. <laughs> the discussion of the millennium, which means, this is on your notes, millennium means a thousand years. It originates from the book of Revelation in the first part of chapter 20. The question often asked from this passage is, what are the thousand years and when will Christ return with respect or considering the thousand years? People want to know this. Here's what Revelation 20 says, just so you can get an idea, verses 2 through 5. An angel sees the dragon, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. That's what Revelation 20, 2 through 5 tells us. Now, four basic views of the millennium that have really just kind of kept going throughout the history of the church. Some have a longer ancestry than others. But let's just look at the four, because I want you to be informed. I want you to, to be able to think through them. The first one's called post-millennialism. People shorten it to say post-mill. I'm a post-mill guy. That's how they would say it if they were claiming this view. All right, this view says that through the binding of Satan, there will be a gradual increase. That goes in that blank. There will be a gradual increase in the growth of the church and spread of the gospel where more and more people will become Christians. The influence of more believers will change society so that it will function as God intended, gradually resulting in an age of peace and righteousness. So that word peace goes there. So in other words, the millennium, which is not necessarily a literal 1,000 years, then Christ will come back post or after that Millennium period. So that's what post mill says. Saints going to be bound. Things are going to get better on earth. It's going to be good. There's going to be peace. And there's going to be righteousness. Then Christ will come back after the millennium. Then you have amillennialism. It's the simplest one and says that Satan's binding will reduce his influence. So that word reduce goes there. So Satan's bound. It will reduce his influence over the nations so the gospel is preached to the whole world. Yet there's a general view that times will worsen. So Satan's bound. Influence isn't going to be as bad, but times will still worsen. Christ's reign is a heavenly one. And the millennium is equivalent to the church age that's currently going on now. So all millennialists believe that we're in the millennium. We're in the, that, that it wasn't a literal thousand years. It's, it was figurative, they would say, that John was saying. And so we're living in it now. And then Christ is going to return and judge believers and unbelievers at once. That's what all millennialists believe. Classic or historic premillennialism, we have to um, say it that way because you'll see why in a moment about a, a newer kind of pre mill. Oh, people will say post mill, people will say amill, the short, they're talking about amill, 
our millennialism. And then if they're talking about classic or historic pre-millennialism, they'll say pre -mill. Obviously, you can see why it's shorter, faster to say that. There are slight variations to the classic pre-mill viewpoint, but it basically states that Christ will come back pre or before the millennium. So before goes there. So the church age will go through the tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation, Satan will be bound. Christ will come back to establish his kingdom on earth for the millennium, which is not necessarily a literal thousand years. It could be a, a period of time like a thousand years. The resurrected believers will reign. That word reign goes there. Resurrected believers will reign with the resurrected Christ physically on earth during this time. Unbelievers will also be on earth at this time. And most will become believers and be saved. At the end of the millennium, Satan is loosed. Christ decisively defeats him and his remaining followers. And the unbelievers from all times past will be judged. And the believers will enter into the eternal state. That's the classic pre-mill. And finally, you have the dispensational pre-mill. It's more of a newer view. And it says that Christ will secretly return for believers before the suffering of the tribulation period. It says during the tribulation, the Jewish people will be left to go through it all and will be ultimately converted. He'll then return for a third time after the tribulation with his saints to rule the earth for 1,000 years. And then the same, the rest of it is like the classic pre mill view. So when you say you want to become part of Eastview Baptist Church, you can sign the, the member covenant and become a member of this church without making a declaration about what you believe about the millennium. All right, this is obviously a controversial issue among evangelicals, but it's only secondary in nature. Our statement of faith, that which we hold to here at Eastview, our statement of faith declares only that which is a matter of fact from scripture and is necessary for our unity as a church. There are many great theologians over the years who have differed on these various views. For example, Augustine, B.B. Warfield, and many others during the great revivals of the past held to a post-mill view. That's, their, that's where they landed. Louis Burkhoff, John Calvin, other reformers, they held to the omnil view. Don Carson, Al Mohler, Wayne Grudem. Uh, Wayne Grudem's the one who you know, writes the big theology book that I showed you a couple months ago where most of our material comes from. He holds the classic pre-mill. Uh, John MacArthur, obviously been in the news a lot these days out in California. He's a dispensational pre-mill. So you see, I mean, here's, these are all solid people. Solid people that I would say, oh, I mean, I would never say they're false teachers necessarily. All have different views on this. So this isn't something that we would disrupt the unity of the church over. And so that's why I put down there the end comment to make about all of these views is that they have all been held by what we would consider genuine Christians and great theologians. It's not an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. Where do you land on one of those? Your salvation does not depend on how you come down and what view you think is right. The important thing is that all of these views have a similar belief that Christ is returning and that judgment is coming. So we must be prepared. That's the last little blank on your paper. And so you see the, um, well, let me ask this question, just not just for your own thoughts. I didn't put the discussion, it wouldn't fit. I was trying to keep it to four pages. Are you ready for Christ to return today? If you knew he were going to return within 24 hours, what situations or relationships would you want to straighten out before he returns? And do you think that the command to be ready means that you should attempt to straighten out those things now, even if you think it unlikely that he would return today? Just something to think about as you go out. What if we did know tomorrow he was coming? Would there be anything in our lives that we needed to straighten out?
today. Because, as I put down there in the main point, Christ is coming back. He's coming back. And he will reign forever and ever. Yeah, amen. That's right. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now, for the wrap-up, we won't be here next week. Um, just with the Thanksgiving um, time. We won't meet next week. But when we come back on Wednesday, December 2nd, we will look at the final judgment, what that looks like. So we're in eschatology the rest, and we have two more times, two more lessons, and we will have done all 20. It's taken us a long time, hasn't it? I'm sorry, I never envisioned it taking the whole year, but um, I've enjoyed it. Um, but we'll we have two more, so final judgment, and then the final one in, on December 9th will be about the new heavens and the new earth. What we've all been waiting for, right? <laughs> Let me pray for us as we go. Father, you are sending your son back to her literally, physically, to rescue the redeemed. And then we will reign with you forever and ever. And so come quickly. That is our prayer. That you come quickly and that in that you would help us to be ready. We'd be watchful and waiting. We'd have our wicks, our lamps trimmed, fully ready to see you crack open the eastern sky. And with loud trumpet fanfare, call us home. Until then, may we live lives of holiness, striving for that which is good and pure and right. And may with our lives, we declare with our mouths the same truth that you are coming back and that others who are far from you need to know the hope of Jesus Christ. May it become such a joy to us that we want to tell our neighbors, we want to tell our lost family members, we want to tell the strangers in our circle of influence that there's a God who loves them. Us safe until we return again, Father. Whatever safe looks like. Because we know that you are in charge and you will keep your own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I put that last little part on there because I was listening to somebody the other day and they were saying, you know, I want to pray that you'll be safely in the center of God's will. And then, and then that person said, but you know what? It's not safe in the center of God's will, but it's right. When you're in the center of his will, it doesn't mean that it's safe. God's safe. So being in the center of his will is good and it's right and it's, it's where we want to be. But that doesn't mean that it's safe all the time. Because uh, being in the, Jesus was in the center of God's will. 